Hi, hi. Uh, good, good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us this morning today. Uh, so we have a very interesting uh, topic lined up for discussion this morning, DeFi versus uh, CeFi. So maybe to start off, uh, I will just go one round of uh, self-introductions, uh, starting with Karan. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. So I am Karan Sharma, the Chief Operating Officer at Zelta Tech. Uh, Zelta Tech is a development, Web3 and blockchain development and consulting company based out of Jaipur, India. Hey guys, I'm John, uh, run operations over at Marina Chain. And yeah, so here, what we do at Marina Chain is that we're focusing on decarbonizing maritime with Web3 and we basically bring on the, um, the carbon credit trading and uh, basically, you know, uh, bring that all into the NFT and uh, Web3 space because of the increased transpa transparency and tra traceability for enterprise. Hey, good morning, everyone. So my name is Marwan. I'm with Consensus. Um, for those, actually, who are a bit involved into the DeFi space, so Consensus has uh, the number one wallet, MetaMask. Um, but we also have the platform for developers, uh, and we have a bunch of magic technical stuff in between. Uh, I'm based in Singapore, and I'm happy today to participate in this panel. Yeah, hi, everyone. Morning. Happy to be here. My name's Andrew. I'm, I'm running Block Demon across APAC. I'm based in Singapore. It's 11 years this year. It's been, it's been, been, a, been a minute. Uh, and Block Demon is the largest institutional node provider of blockchains. We support uh, well over 50 protocols now. We're also uh, the largest institutional staking provider, you know, uh, with billions and billions of dollars delegated to our validators, about, about 30 protocols on that side uh, as well. And also we've got a bunch of infrastructure, APIs, and some, some emerging payment solutions. So uh, happy to be here as well. Hi everyone, my name is Lucas. Um, I'm, for me, my experience in the uh, blockchain space has been since 2016. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Earthin. So Earthin, it's a mobile play to metaverse uh, where, think of Pokemon Go, you know, where players can monetize their experiences and whatever rewards they earn in the mobile metaverse, they can also utilize and spend in the real world. Yep, so that's a summarized version of what we do. Yep, thank you everyone. Uh, so my name is Charles. I'm an uh, investment director at uh, UOB Venture Management. Uh, I look after all the uh, Web3 blockchain investments at the firm. Yeah, so without further ado, uh, maybe let's uh, jump, jump right in. Um, so I think the first question to the panelists, I guess, to set the context, right? I think, um, you know, as we know, the crypto industry has evolved so much so quickly. Right over over a short period of time, uh, literally every day there are like new terms, terminology being invented, uh, just by virtue of the amount of innovation that's going on in this space. So I guess um, you know five years ago, if you were to speak to someone in the financial services industry and you you you, you say you are you are a C5 guy, he'll be like you know what what are you talking about, right? So I think the industry has evolved a lot. So I think um, maybe to start off the panel discussion, um, if someone were to go to you guys and ask, you know, what is CFI and uh, what is DeFi, um, how would you explain it to them? Maybe uh, Maroon? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll try to explain it as simple as possible. Um, essentially, imagine you have a friend who's good with finances, and so he comes to you and your friends and tells you, well, pull your money together, give it to me, and I'll go invest it on your behalf, and then make some gains and share with you. And so that kind of relationship is really based on trust, um, and that's where the relationship with CFI is. So you're essentially investing your money in a trustworthy service, either based on regulation or based on brand or whatever it is. Now, on the other hand, if you receive an email from a Nigerian prince and tells you, send me some money to you know, get some gains for me, you cannot really trust this person across the internet. And this is where DeFi come in play because it sets essentially programs and applications and, and rules that allows people to send their money to the Nigerian prince and guarantee that the Nigerian prince will pay them back. Uh, so that's essentially it. Either you choose to work based on trust in terms of investment or you choose to work based on trust in, in a technology and a, and a contract that is on, on the blockchain. Yeah, thanks. Um, Karan, your thoughts? Uh, so uh, if you talk about CFI, 
what uh, happens in CFI is if like my money is stored in a bank, I want to withdraw say $10,000. I write a check, I get it approved from the bank manager and then my money gets withdrawn. But when we talk about DeFi, the entire control is in my wallet. Be it MetaMask or any other wallet, the entire control is in my hands. I just have to confirm the transaction, it runs over various nodes, the transactions get complete. So, uh, the major difference which I feel between CFI and DeFi is that the user has the complete ownership of his assets, not any third party involved, not any intermediary like brokerages, exchanges and banks. Thank you. Um, John, um, how would you explain to someone C5 versus D5 in, in simple ways? Uh, I mean, I think uh, the, I mean, my, uh, the two of them actually kind of nailed it pretty accurately. But if I do have something to add, it would be like, um, I think something that's still fresh in our minds from the past couple of weeks was actually the recent Celsius crash. I'm not sure, I hope no one here was involved in them, but if they have been, then um, stay strong. <laughs> yeah, um, so Celsius is an example of what we call uh, CD5, which is ultimately still C5 hot, where you put it, to, uh, you have to trust them not to do anything stupid with your money, and you put money with them, and they, uh, they you know, they, they actually skim a bit off the top. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's pertinent in the discussion between C5 and D5 that there are some companies out there who do advertise as D5, um, you can see in all the copy, but it's still ultimately centralized. If you have no, if you if you have to trust someone, um, trust like uh, a, a group of people with your money instead of like smart contracts or code. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I think this uh, leads on to the next question, right? If uh, we were to so-called do some uh, crystal balling, right? Look into the future and do some prediction. Uh, obviously, I think we all agree that um, DeFi uh, has taken shape rapidly over the last uh, three, four years. So with this um, emergence of uh, DeFi, do you see DeFi as eventually replacing CeFi at some point in time, meaning they are mutually exclusive? Or do you see a case where DeFi and CeFi can actually coexist with each other in, in the new financial world? Um, Andrew, your thoughts? Yeah, look, I, I think it's going to be uh, coexistence. I, I think, you know, I think most people will think about, you know, uh, their investment and, and the yield they want to generate. And for some specific pur uh, purpose, they may want like a human kind of interaction or, you know, they trust, you know, a centralized authority or entity. And then for some sort of interactions, you know, they may, you know, they may, you know, they may think that a protocol approach is the way to go and trust in software, trust in code, trust in a scalable protocol. So look, I, I don't see DeFi taking over CeFi, but I do think uh, as crypto users, we're gonna have more choice and more options. And we're gonna need to think a little bit more uh, uh, about where, where we place like our assets and what sort of yield we're going for. So I think we'll have more choice. I think we need to think in, as individuals and institutions about our, our investment strategies. And so I think m more thinking needs to happen, you know, on, on the actual kind of allocation, the risk profile, the risk tolerance. You know, I personally, I'm in some very boring, safe C5 uh, yield products, and I'm personally in some, you know, the opposite of that. And, you know, I'm thinking about that. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to more tracking and, asset tracking kind of tooling coming out as well. And I think there's, there's a big opportunity in that space as well. Yep, thanks Andrew. Um, so Andrew believes that uh, C5 and D5 can coexist with each other. Lucas, your thoughts? So um, if you look at C5 and D5, right, um, <clears throat> in simple terms, when it comes to C5, you got someone to blame. You've got some, if something, ha something happens, right? And in D5, the only person you can look to is yourself. You can only blame yourself, right? Because you are the one who hold your own keys. So that's also one of the downside to DeFi. Now, to your question, right, will um, people move towards DeFi in the future? I personally believe, yes. Um, and I also agree that it will coexist. Uh, but mainly because I feel DeFi will be a lot, have a lot more outreach in the future because a lot of people in this uh, world don't have access to having a bank account, right? Um, they want to apply for a bank account, you know, they, 
you know, there's so much things to do. In, maybe not, not in Singapore or first world countries, but many in the third world countries. So decentralized finance, I believe, can change all of that. It really gives others an opportunity to get in, right, uh, participate in the thing. And of course, for decentralized finance, it faces its issues right now. Right? Uh, unlike uh, CeFi, you know, DeFi is very reliant on the network. For example, Ethereum, right? And if Ethereum were to have congested issues, you know, uh, major changes such as you know moving from their proof of work consensus to the new 2.0 consensus, right? Th this kind of major change causes uh, issues in the network, and this directly affects the decentralized finance platform. So there's still instability and uh, uncertainty, right? <clears throat> so until all these are resolved um, and having the larger pool of liquidity, I see. Uh, DeFi not yet that yet not yet there yet. All right, but eventually I believe with um, the direction it's going, it eventually can reach to the larger adoption. Yep. So DeFi is still relatively new, emerging, but there's still a lot of room for growth, and you see that at some point in time, DeFi, CFI can actually uh, complement yep. each other. Yes. Um, Karan, I have the same views. I guess both of them covered the entire topic. I'll add a slightly different um, dimension to that as well. I, I see it actually as a progression, as in, in the journey of an investor. Usually, C5 is much easier to onboard on, and so it's like you know investment on training wheels. And so it's part of it's going to be part of the education of bringing people into the space, bringing people into investing in different um, crypto and yield generation and whatnot. But then after that, I guess for some of those people, they will graduate and they will say, well, let's go to the Wild West. And very much like uh, Lucas mentioned, the Wild West is still you know being tested and so on, so there is some risks there. So I think it's a bit more for an advanced level. Um, so I, I see them complementing each other. You, probably most of us here will start with CFI and then they will graduate a little bit into uh, DeFi protocols. So yes. CFI is more like a gateway for people to start on yep. board and then naturally learn more about the space and then progress to, to yep. DeFi, right? Yeah, uh, just want to add on to that, to say that I think generally um, another thing that we, people look at is Basically, a take rate of C5 versus D5 in terms of how much, you know, how much earnings you can earn. Um, because, like, in C5, I think the most common form of C5 for most people around the world is basically depositing it into a savings account, right? You put money into your bank, they give you less than a percent of interest, and um, yeah, and then the bank just takes the funds and invests it somewhere else. So, on one hand, they take a lot of your of the possible, possible earnings of your money, but you are pretty much assured that it's safe. It's a safe investment, and you're not going to lose it. Um, on the other hand, C5 is where everything is pretty much automated in terms of smart contracts. Um, there's, there's no need for KYC, etc. So you give up that layer of security, but in exchange, that generally you get higher yields. Now I'm not talking about like 100% or really crazy yields that's caused by either yield farming or I mean. Uh, pretty much because of the growth of the Web3 industry, but also the fact that what, even after the industry matures, I think DeFi, by virtue of its greater efficiency, will also still net greater returns than what you see in CeFi on average. Thanks. Yeah, so I'd like to switch gear a little bit and um, I think talk about something that's closer to everyone's heart, which is the returns, the you generation point of view, because I think a lot of people when they are first attracted to this space of DeFi is actually the potential yield that they can generate versus traditional financial products. So I want to touch a little bit about this. And um, to the panelists, let's say I'm a new to DeFi. I like to get in this space and generate some the outsized returns, uh, but I'm new. How would you recommend to me what kind of yield generation strategies I should go after? Andrew? Yeah, so firstly, I'm a hodler. So I would recommend like, to most people that they should be thinking about a diversified strategy, you know, picking your, uh, doing your research, picking your favorite projects, probably locking that up with some staking, right? And thinking about that as sort of a base layer for yield generation and getting comfortable there. That's normally where I start the conversation, um, just bringing people back to the safest way to earn yield. And then, but you know, also, you know, I use a lot of DeFi, protocols as well and I usually recommend like just if you see something that's interesting and and you're excited just think of it as a learning experience so I can tell you what I do personally and what I recommend to my friends is, is have a look at the protocol think about what's the minimum amount 
of investment to try all the features and kind of run through the protocol and get comfortable and, and put that amount in and have a play and learn and learn the features and learn the functions and, and then start to build a strategy. I, I personally try a lot of DeFi protocols. Um, there's a lot that I'm like, look, this one's good, but it's not for me personally. And then I start to then assess, do I, do I put more in? Do I pull, do I pull my initial kind of investment out? But at least, even if it's not for me, I've had that learning opportunity. And I think people can start to build their own mental models around DeFi by learning. So I'd encourage HODL, secure your base, think about a low risk kind of strategy, and then actually get in, get involved, and, and play with a lot of DeFi protocols and work out what's for you, right? I don't recommend just aping into one with all your assets. And I know a lot of people will do that and get excited, but I think you're better off trying 10, 15, or even more and really working out. Because I don't think, I think this is a choose your own adventure market, and I don't think there's one right answer. Yeah, but that's my perspective. Diversification and uh, experimentation along the way, right? Lucas? So, <clears throat> so um, personally, uh, I would think that if um, a friend were to ask me, you know, I want to participate in DeFi, right? Uh, I would say try a little bit first, right? Don't, don't put all your eggs into one, right? Don't put everything in and trust it. So, uh, because personally, I believe DeFi has a uh, huge potential and I believe that it can revolutionize the industry. Uh, but in every revolution, there's always sacrifice, right? Uh, and in sacrificial uh, moments, right, uh, there'll be times where people lose money, right? Projects coming in to rug pool, to scam, uh, people losing their wallets and all this. this. This is just a phase that happens before, you know, things get better, uh, before a revolution takes place. So uh, I would recommend, um, just try a little bit. Um, the whole intention is not to make a lot of money. The whole intention is to really educate yourself in the beginning, uh, be an early adopter, be an innovator, right? Part of, the, part of this uh, revolution. Um, and before it happens. So, so don't be the laggard when it happens. Yeah, so I would really uh, you know, recommend people, right? Try a little bit first, right? Test it out, different, different things and understand different, different protocols, right? To really get themselves educated about where this whole thing is going. Yeah. Karan, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, my personal opinion is almost similar to what Lucas and Andrew said. Uh, so whenever like a friend of mine asked me, is it a good time to get into Dogecoin or the Bitcoin? That is like a very similar question everyone here must have faced. So uh, I answer them with, uh, you first learn about the space, learn about the technology, the power of the DeFi which gives you to uh, take care of your own assets, learn about the project, what the project is doing, how is it functioning. So uh, what I feel is education is very important to get into a space. The space is uh, in its very early phases and it's emerging. So to get into the masses, we need to get them educated first, get them aware about the space. Once they are aware about the space, they can take their own decisions. Yeah, that's can, what I feel. Can I, can I add one more? Um, um, do it with a buddy. Think about scuba diving. You go diving like in a pair. Like we're all in a bunch of broad crypto groups and there's lots of people and it's noisy. But I do think is, you know, what's been super helpful for me personally is I've got five very close friends that are in this and I'm like, hey, I like this protocol. What are you thinking? Are you in? What are you doing? And that sort of, you know, small group buddy system learning has been very helpful for me. And I do think, like, if, if you are going to go aggressively into DeFi, like, find a friend that's going to... Uh, go on the journey with you has been very helpful. Like, it's easy to get into the big crypto groups and they're all noisy. I suggest you need a, a small, small group as well. That's been you're, helpful for me. You're sending invites? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joining your group. <laughs> <laughs> no, my portfolio is not good. Um, I want to add some color on that as well. Um, not all of us has to go into DeFi, right? So if you're not an investor, if you're already not investing before, don't just like, you know, have, have a FOMO on it and say, well, I have to go into DeFi, everybody going in. The space is larger than just DeFi and there is ways for you to make money in other, in other areas. So for example, GameFi, um, art. Staking. Staking. <laughs> um, also actually by building, by participating in the industry, by being developers, creating companies. And so crypto, let's say in general, blockchain even as a bigger term, it's not just about DeFi. And honestly, if, if investment did not excite you before crypto, 
it's the same. So if you're not an investor, no point in becoming one now. If you're excited, if you want to learn, of course, there's a lot of opportunities to learn. But also think about the other areas that you can invest into the space, not necessarily by buying bitcoins and coins and whatnot. So that's just a different perspective. Uh, John? Yeah, I uh, just wanted to add that, um, yeah, like, um, you know, the markets can go up a lot. They can go down a lot. Uh, so whatever you do, even if you stay really safe, it can still be at the whims of, um, you know, macroeconomic f factors. But ultimately, when you are in a space, and since it's a steep learning curve, the thing that, um, I guess the ultimate investment is basically your skills, your knowledge in the space itself. And, you know, there's a lot of things you need to learn, like risk management, um, being able to look into a protocol and see whether it has potential, whether it's a rock pool, and so on. And these, regardless of which point in the macro macroeconomic cycle or the broad bear market you're caught in, will continue to go up. So, like, basically in that process of learning, um, yeah, just, you know, don't get wrecked by the market, don't get washed out. I personally have a lot of, not a lot of people who basically they ape into one coin and, um, yeah, because something happened, then yeah, um, they lost a lot of savings and, and they basically got disenchanted with the space. And, yeah, so ultimately during the process of investing into your own knowledge, don't lose all your resources or your capital. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so at this point in time, actually, I'd like to uh, switch, switch gear a little bit and uh, talk about um, regulations, right? Because um, uh, it's easy to regulate a C5 platform, the central authority, there's someone to go after, regulators are comfortable with it. But in the DeFi space, peer-to-peer, -peer, smart contract-driven protocol, it may be challenging to actually uh, put some regulatory framework around uh, DeFi. So how are, how are you guys uh, thinking about you know, DeFi financial services from a regulatory um, point of view. Um, I'll, I'll touch on this one because it's a, it's a topic very close to our company's uh, work. In the DeFi space and in a trustless economy, there is other ways that we try to protect the users, right? Regulation is, of course, works in, in central systems, but then there is other areas that we can work on. First of all is education. So all of us here, we're involved in educating the community and getting people to interact safely with whatever is out there on the blockchain. The, the second part, for example, in, in consensus, we have the MetaMask wallet, which we use, um, it's, it's widely used, and so we're continuously working on improving small things in the user experience to make it safer. So, for example, you know, compared to last year, the message that pops up on you to approve a transaction, now it's a bit more human readable, so read what you're going to sign before, before you sign it. Um, we're working with, um, for instance, we've launched a program where it, it's kind of like a, a legal company that if you get hacked, let's say, it will act on your behalf and will file for a class, uh, class action suit on the back, and so it will kind of try to protect the users and bring the money back. Um, then, of course, there is a lot of investment that uh, we're doing and many companies are doing into the audit, the security of the smart contracts, of the protocols, um, and lastly, building reliable infrastructure that makes the systems run and, you know, it, it makes it a little bit easy to guarantee that reliability of the, of the system. So it's not so much regulation, but it's more about adding the different pieces into the user journey to make the ultimate goal of blockchain, which is creating a trust that is based purely on technology. Like, you don't need a regulator to come and protect you or you don't need somebody to, to fight for you. Um, so that's the approach that I see happening a lot in the DeFi space. And for us at Block Demon, like, you know, regulatory is a, a competitive advantage. So for ex specific examples, like we have a chief compliance officer, like, you know, we're thinking and we're talking a lot, you know, to the regulators in the US as well around what the future state should look like. We've just recently launched a permissioned DeFi product. We do KYC, KYB. We can answer questions for institutions around commingling, et cetera. Like, so all of those disclaimers and, you know, uh, discussions are done up front before we bring institutions into our, into our, our uh, permission DeFi platform as well. Obviously, that's on the institutional side, so you can have more of a B2B institutional motion where all of this is discussed. Um, but that's, that's definitely where Block Demon plays. So, like, that's how we're thinking about that specific space as well. Yep. Lucas, any thoughts? Regulations point of view? So, um, again, when it comes to regulation, um, it's important because uh, regulation is required to in place to protect, you know, the, the people, right? Uh, retail investors especially. Uh, but uh, again, 
In my opinion, right, decentralized finance, the whole entire intention, right, it's really to take out the middle <laughs> intermediary, right, to connect peer to peer. Um, and I'm, I'm skeptical about regulation, right, uh, because with regulations coming into place, um, you know, requiring KYC and all that kind of stuff, um, I'm not sure how it's going to take place for decentralized finance in order for decentralized finance to actually uh, work. So um, personally, I think that um, regulations is important um, to protect users, but I feel that things should be, things should take place in its natural course of events, right? Where people get uh, educated really more in how it works, um, you know, how peer-to-peer -peer works, and really trust in a protocol. Because decentralized finance, the beauty of it is a trustless protocol system, right? And, and that is the beauty of it. That, that's the purity of where this is going. Um, and I feel that, you know, taking the natural cost, it should be that direction. Yeah, I'm not saying no regulation. I'm just saying that, um, you know, to really trust in the process that this will happen. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think more DeFi protocols are building these capabilities in um, as well, like recently I've seen some with insurance offerings built in, um, you know, Block Demon as well has insurance. We have insurance uh, on slashing and double signing and we power a lot of DeFi protocols underneath that as well and now we're seeing protocols thinking about other, other levels of insurance and looking after their users as well. So I think also, you know, we should acknowledge that the protocols are actually thinking about these capabilities you know, without the regulators as well. They're building these sort of safety nets in as well. Karan? Yeah. So I have like similar thoughts. P2P transactions are something which are not new. They were like earlier times, uh, they were traveler's checks, which, you, uh, which used to work as a P2P uh, method. But uh, if we talk about regulations, uh, there needs to be certain criteria for the auditing of smart contracts. They need to be a bit better than they are uh, getting right now. We can also uh, do KYDs for the developers. So that actually we have a, we, we know who is behind the project. Who, so that we can like categorize the uh, projects likewise. Also, uh, if we talk about the centralized framework as well, it is, uh, not so that there are no scams in the centralized space. There are scams, people are being scammed in the centralized space as well. So it is not just regulations that can help people uh, out with the uh, saving their money or uh, saving their investment. I'd like to highlight the same point again, that is education. People need to be aware, be it centralized or decentralized, the regulatory bodies will be formed not now, maybe later, but yeah, people have to take care of their own stuff. They have to like do their own research before investing. John, any thoughts? Um, I think they summed up pretty nicely for this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think uh, conscious of time, so I think we probably have time for just one last quick fire question. Um, so if there is um, one tip or one advice you would give to the uh, participants here uh, who want to get some exposure to DeFi, or get into the DeFi space, or work in DeFi, uh, what would it be? Left to right, maybe. Karan? Yeah. Yeah, it's the same, like, educate yourself, be aware about the technology, do your own research, just don't run, about, run after 10x or 100x coins, just do your own research, look at what the project is all about, understand the technology, and yeah, invest wisely. John? Um, again, like what I mentioned was, Basically, invest in your own knowledge. Start small, um, and once you got, you're, you're more confident, you find a group of people like um, what some of us have mentioned, um, and you know, bounce your ideas off them, and you know, sharpen each other up. Um, do not invest more than you're willing to lose, and um, never tell your wife how much you invested. <laughs> Everything the the panelists have said. Two things. I think take a learner's mindset. To this, there's no rush. DeFi is very new, and then I would always encourage you to hodl and stake a large part of like your assets as well, and just have quite a bit of your investment strategy in a safe, uh, consistent manner. And then you can feel more comfortable about some more semi-speculative kind of DeFi projects. Um, so, like Andrew just now mentioned, he have a close group of friends, right? 
um, you know, to um, talk about this together. So for me, I also have a close group of five, five of us. Um, and among all five of us, uh, four of them have very high IQ. I'm the slowest in learning. So the way I actually approached this was, you know, buy everything, you know, just a little bit, little bit. And it isn't much, you know, I went to an exchange last time, uh, called Polynex. I buy every coin for $20. <laughs> Um, and just to really experience and try to understand it. So when you dabble, you, you, you know, but you don't really know. But when you really jump into the pool, right, uh, you really, from there, you start to figure out um, everything, right, because your money is at stake already, right? When you're really in the pool, you're trying to figure out how to swim. You really learn how to swim when you jump into the pool, not when you dabble it, into it. So um, that is my advice. Uh, I'm not saying throw your whole life fortune into it. <clears throat> I'm just saying um, use something that it's slightly pain enough to to go and really help you experience what this whole crypto, blockchain, and you know, decentralized finance world is all about. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit of uncomfortableness is a forcing function for accelerated learning. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, guys. Uh, with that, we come to the end of this uh, panel discussion. Thank you for your wonderful thank insights. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Charles.